Hi, this is Todd McLeese, and welcome to the first episode of the Growth Minded Podcast. On this show, we focus on identifying and distilling the ingredients that help companies grow faster. We do that by interviewing founders and leaders of fast-growing companies from anywhere in the world in search of concepts, processes, and systems that can be directly applied by companies here in the Midwest. We also dive into the leadership techniques they use and the habits they've developed that allow them to execute at a high level. We talk to community leaders, best-selling authors, and global thought leaders on a wide range of topics, all connected to business and personal growth. The Growth Minded Podcast is available on iTunes and SoundCloud. The video version and show notes are available on YouTube and on our podcast website, growthminded.io. I'm so excited to release the first episode of the show featuring Andy Nunnemaker. After a successful six-year run at GE Healthcare, he signed on as the CEO of EM Systems in 2004. When they sold the business to Intermedics in 2010, it became one of the more notable success stories in the history of the Wisconsin early-stage investment community. After we recorded the show, I ran across an old post by the co-founder of One Reality AB, a Silicon Valley company. He wrote, Silicon Valley is not just a state of mind. It is a spirit of sharing and paying forward to new entrepreneurs and society. It's about giving and celebrating together, not just taking from others. That passage fits today's guest perfectly. Andy is certainly known as a consummate serial entrepreneur in Milwaukee. Today, he's CEO at Dynamis, a growth stage SaaS company in Milwaukee that serves the employee benefits insurance industry across the U.S. I've known him for a few years, and he's clearly one of our great business thinkers. But he also has a significant presence in the performing arts community, especially given his involvement with the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra, which he covers later in the episode. Every stop along his career path has produced new lessons that have shaped Andy's leadership style, and he covers a lot of those throughout this episode. I encourage you to pay particular attention to the items at the top of his priority list, especially in terms of his selfless focus on putting the members of his team in a position to be successful. So that should suffice for introducing the show and this episode. Thanks for listening. Our idea for a little business-oriented podcast has turned out to be quite an undertaking, but even more rewarding. I hope you enjoy it, and if you do, please share it with your friends and colleagues. That would mean a lot as we get this thing off the ground. And with that, let's get on with Episode 1 of the Growth Minded Podcast. Andy, thanks for joining us on the show. Happy to be here. Can we spend just a few minutes talking about the early stages of your career? Yeah, I started out on a pretty conventional career path. Um, My first job out of college was with um, Southwestern Bell Corporation, now AT&T. Um, did a rotational program there, a year in sales, year in operations, year in finance. Um, went off to get an MBA and then came back and worked for GE for six years. Um, and even though that wasn't a rotational program, um, I did have five different roles in those six years. That was the days where GE would put you in a position, you'd make an impact, and then they'd move you to something else. And it was pretty rapid succession of, of various roles all in management. Um, you know, some of the highlights were running the operations at the Waukesha headquarters of GE Healthcare, so um, running the factory there, um, running the business for Australia, New Zealand, and then Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. Where did you live during that time? Um, during that time, I lived in Sydney, um, and then when the um, the South Southeast Asia became available, they asked us to roll that all into one region with the headquarters in Singapore. So my negotiation was, um, be happy to do that, but um, we're going to keep my location in Sydney. Is there a particular leadership lesson that resonated with you early on that you're still paying attention to today? It's an easy one. It's, it's being 100% present with everybody. Um, it's dropping everything when someone comes into the office. Um, it's being there and mentoring and guiding and being available whenever somebody needs me. We're a small enough company. Right? Anyone should be able to walk in my office, and I should be able to drop anything and give them the attention and the time that they need. And it doesn't always happen. And when it doesn't happen, I catch myself and and often just run back in and apologize and say, let's let's do that again. Being completely focused on the present moment seems like such a difficult skill to master. It's certainly a popular topic these days. Have you ever worked for somebody that was really great at that? Who's yeah, that? My, my first boss at GE, Dennis Cook, um, he had a team, and there were three or four of us on that team um, who still stay in touch to this day. We felt like he was spending over half of his time in his role ensuring that we were successful with our GE careers. Mm. Uh, it felt like he was spending every ounce of his energy in setting us up 
for success. And I tell you what, we'd, we'd stay at work until 11 o'clock. We wouldn't think twice about it. it, it we, we'd just jump through walls for that guy because we knew he had our back and felt like all of his time and attention was watching out for us. Um, it's a quality that I, I obviously admire and one that I try to emulate. So when you rolled out of GE Healthcare, how did, how did that happen? Yeah, interestingly, I was in a role at GE Healthcare that's probably the most relevant to my um, my post GE life. I was running um, a major operation to overhaul um, applications that touched pricing and sales, and basically developing a CRM and a configuration engine. Mm. Um, and that really translated into my life after after GE. Um, but I was given an opportunity by Tim Keen. I was part of the Golden Angel Network, um, and we found. We found a company that really didn't have a leadership team um, and wanted to, to spin off into its own entity. So um, Tim introduced me to them, and away we went. What you're talking about is EM Systems, and that was such a great success story for the early-stage investors. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So um, a, a few doctors had an idea of um, publicizing through the web um, – availability of hospitals and ER. So there was a problem with, um, they call it ambulance diversion, um, where an ambulance would come and pick you up, say you, you crashed your motorcycle, hit your head, and they just drive around to the nearest hospital. And if the CT was down or they couldn't treat you, they'd have to drive to another hospital. And it was a, you know, phone calls and paper and pencil type of a system. Um, so they developed a system where it would automatically update the status of all of the emergency rooms in any given region. Um, and they'd sold it to a few different municipalities and decided we want to spin this into its own company. Um, so when I came in, it had less than a million dollars in revenue, three and five employees. And um, we basically grew that. By the end of it, we covered 80 percent of the United States. Mm. So y- you had significant responsibility at GE Healthcare at the time when you were uh, invited to take a look at this role or the company yeah. right through Golden Angels. What drove you to the decision to sort of get the entrepreneurial bug and join an early stage company yeah. to help it grow? You know, the way I look at that is um, I try to assess the situation and then I try to choose the path of least regret. Hmm. So hmm. I could see myself 10 years from that decision still at GE and, and I knew exactly what my path was. I knew what level I'd be at. I knew what salary I'd be at, et cetera. Were you still in Sydney at the time? Uh, I was or, in Milwaukee. You were back. Time. Okay. Um, but – I had no idea what would happen with this startup. And I could see myself 10 years down the road still at GE saying, oh, my gosh, if only I had done that, Mm -hmm. who knows where my life could have been. And so I chose the opportunity that would have the least regret down the road. It's a really interesting compass. I tell you what, if the thing failed, I go back and get my old job at GE. So to me, there wasn't a lot of risk in in that, even though looking back, yeah, it it was risky. But for me personally, I had a a soft landing. Were you seeking – entrepreneurial opportunities at the time or was I wasn't. it just something that was presented it to was you? It was presented to me and I, I thought this is an opportunity that's too good to pass up. During your time at EM Systems, what would you say is the most important lesson you learned about growing early stage companies? Best professional advice I've ever been given is um, knowing my weaknesses and, and hiring to compensate for them, not faking it. Um, it was actually Sue Marks who was on the board of directors of EM Systems in the early days. And I said, well, we're so small, you know, I'll just, I'll keep the books. I'll just be the CFO and the CEO. And, you know, that's where she said, you're either incredibly arrogant or incredibly stupid. Um, I'm going to go with stupid. And this is why you need a CFO. When you look at a management team in the role of an early stage investor, is that level of self-awareness something that you focus on or are there other qualities that you find more important? Yeah, I think one one tell is um, people who don't listen are not going to make good entrepreneurs. And people that don't listen are not going to be able to grow and scale businesses. You've got to be able to get ideas from everywhere. The ones that think they're the smartest in the room um, are the ones I run away from. Can you talk a little bit about the Golden Angels involvement and how your own listening skill has played a role either at EM Systems or at Dynamis? You know, Dynamis probably didn't need outside money we could have probably done it with our own money as the co-founders but you know to me a group like the golden angels they call it smart money and it it is smart money we've got two amazing board members from the golden angels that um one has vast sales experience and helped us understand sales and helped us understand that process the other has a tremendous 
deal structure experience and can really help us as we were doing funding rounds and other things and really creating uh, the incentives of, of the company for, for the employees. So, I mean, we've, we meet with them all the time. I'm emailing them with questions all the time. So having that sounding board is, is really valuable. <coughs> Is there a certain piece of advice you'd give to other founders who are perhaps seeking outside money or angel money at this point? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, companies take um, leaps in valuation. I tell the founder to get their company as far along in the process on their own. Shore up as um, much as you can. Shore up as much as they can. An idea isn't really worth that much. I hear 100 ideas every day. They're not worth that much. A working prototype. All right, actually building the solution, whether it's a technology or a service, is worth a little more. And then going out and being able to to sell to strangers at list price. Yeah. Um, now you're on to something. And it just seems like the more ingredients of execution that you can bring to the table, the more likely you are to have a favorable valuation. You'll have a fa- favorable valuation, and you'll have validated your assumptions. You know, the, the thing I see time and time again, you know, An idea all of a sudden has a five-year business plan. Well, every single number on that business plan is bogus. They're all assumptions. And the more of those assumptions you can validate, the better chance you are of finding deal room with an angel investor. Can you talk a little bit about the company and your role in the market? Yeah, Dynamis essentially helps brokers and um, agents who sell health insurance um, to employers uh, make that decision-making process, that renewal process, as painless as possible. Today, most brokers use Excel spreadsheets. They try to model complex plans, and anytime there's a question, they have to run back to the office, remodel, process goes over five or six meetings, takes a few months. We package all that into one meaningful meeting, um, and it really helps the employers make their make the right decision. How would you define your, your total available market or your strike zone? How many... How many agencies uh, actually make sense for, yeah. from a Dynamis perspective? Yeah, there are, um, there are about 12,000 independent agencies in the United States. Um, we think 6,000 of those are in our target market. We're not really looking at the, the one- or two-person mom or pop shop, um, and we're not really looking at the, the top three. But anyone else in that, in that middle is really in our sweet spot. Just from a timeline standpoint, you've been there about four years? Yeah, we started Dynamis four years ago. Again, we um, we had some founders that came up with the idea mm-hmm. and really wanted to turn it into a into a company. They approached the Golden Angels, and and together we went off and built it. We really spent the first couple of years understanding the market, throwing out test solutions, really following clients through the process, and really understanding where the pain points were before we came up with what I would call our minimally viable product. Okay, so. I mean, at this point, you've emerged from startup phase to growth stage, right? Yes, what, finally. Yeah. <laughs> the, the last couple of years, you talked about the first couple of years. The last two years, what's evolved at Dynamis in your mind? What's been the key to the growth and the success? Yeah, r- really understanding. So we, we came out with a minimally viable product a couple of years ago. Well, that that's one thing. That's the technology portion of our solution. But we really were able to understand the impact it was having on our clients. It wasn't just helping them. With the renewal process, it was helping them sell more business. It was helping them prospect. It was helping them with retention. It was helping them with their own client satisfaction. And as we saw that message evolve only through time and use of the solution and really being out there with the clients, then we really understood what we were what, what we were onto. So as you approach 6,000 agencies, you mentioned that you run into an apathetic response sometimes, which really just relates to it's, it's status quo. It's good enough. We've built this spreadsheet for the last 20 years and yeah. we're not going to move away from it. What are some of the key drivers for an agency that they have responded to as you've learned how to successfully sell into right. organizations of every size? Well, you know, interestingly, if you subscribe to chasm theory, um, that's the exact path that we're following. The first people that bought that minimally viable product were, were the innovators. All right, then we moved into the early adopters, Mm -hmm. which is where we are today. We're still really selling only to innovators and early adopters. And now we're at the point where we're getting some validation from the market. We're getting real successes. We're learning that this isn't just an efficiency play cutting down on the number of meetings. This is actually delighting the end client, the employers. Um, It's turning the process around from one that they said they dreaded and they hated to one that they actually enjoy and find pleasant. Why and, is that? What what contributes to that with, well, the, it, with it, the Dynamis solution? It makes the employer's life so much easier. They're confident that they're making the right decision on their health plans. 
Um, in the old days, you'd bring an Excel spreadsheet in. You'd show them some numbers. You might show them a, compares, a comparison or two. And the minute that employer said, that sounds good, what about this, what about that, and makes one small tweak, the broker runs back to their office, does a bunch of modeling, and comes back a week later. You know, the employer has no idea what was happening in that black hole. With us, it's all right there in front of them, and they just have that confidence that they're making the right decision because they can see the information. So while you're in growth phase, one of the key things is how do we scale, right? right. Do you feel like you're getting closer to cracking that code in, in terms of uh, how Dynamis scales? Now that we've got a handle on metrics like customer acquisition cost, lifetime value of the customer, et cetera, um, now we're at a point where those metrics have fallen into line and now it's time to scale, and now it's time to really execute on the growth plan. Dynamis is serving agencies on a national level. Right. Uh, what's the competitive landscape look like? So what, what Dynamis really competes with um, is apathy. We're a brand-new solution. Um, agents aren't typically out looking for our solution. Um, most of them don't know it exists unless they've lost to a client who, who uses us. What are the agencies using now that Dynamis streamlines? Status quo is an Excel spreadsheet. Okay. Um, and – to some agents, that that's good enough. So really, apathy is is our competition. No one out on the, uh, no one else in the marketplace is offering a solution like ours. That'll change as we as we grow and we show some successes. I'm sure there'll be copycat solutions coming. Um, so we just have to make sure we stay ahead of the game. What are some of the lessons you learned in the last ninety or one hundred and eighty days as the company's reached a different phase in its growth cycle? You know what what we're learning now is um, for the for the first ten or fifteen employees. Um, Everyone we hired was one degree of separation. Every single one of our employees was brought to us by someone we already knew. Now we're getting to the point where we're scaling large enough that we have to go out and hire unknown entities. So a little more process-driven. We need process-driven hiring now, and we didn't need that at the beginning. That would say that talent attraction is is probably a challenge, just given the market. And, and sure. The market is is ridiculously hot, not just for developers, but for um, for every aspect of our business. Yeah. And that means we have to we have to get it right. We have to shine. I think we have a very compelling story of why people would want to work for our company. We have to get that across. But more importantly, we've got to make sure that the people we're bringing in are a perfect match. Andy, what sort of environment have you worked to develop at Dynamis to attract new high-quality employees? So, um, what I think we offer, um, we have a small company. It's an entrepreneurial environment. I'm hoping... Um, someone's getting more than just a paycheck when they work for us. They're, they're understanding why I make the decisions I make and why our leadership team is making the decisions we're making together. They're really getting a crash course in entrepreneurship. Um, in fact, if you look at EM Systems, a few of the employees we brought on were solely brought on because they wanted to start their own company and they wanted to run their own company someday, and three, of them, three or four of them are doing that right now. Hmm. So as you've brought in the, that next generation of employees and grown the team at Dynamis, what kind of feedback have you gotten in terms of what they have found most rewarding in joining the team at Dynamis? Yeah, you know, I hear two things. One, people like to be part of a winning team, um, and Dynamis is a winning team, and we celebrate those wins together in, in many different ways. Um, and number two, really the, the openness and transparency of being at a company like Dynamis with a culture of, of transparency um, – you know, we've got entry-level folks who are really learning entrepreneurship and learning how to run a business and learning what it takes and learning about the decisions that you go through every day in, in creating a company. Uh, and that's really exciting to be in that kind of environment. What do you do to foster transparency in a, in a growth stage company like that? Well, we, I mean, we have some forcing functions and we have some processes. I'm, I'm not a fan of introducing process to a company prematurely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've just introduced a few and a, there were a few speed bumps, and it's it's the time to put those in. But really, it's 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 informal, um, and it's just being there, and it's talking, and it's being available, and it's getting together every Friday afternoon over a few drinks and just talk about the week and what happened, and um, and just being open. Knowing what you know now, if you could turn back the clock to your early days at Dynamis, is there a particular piece of advice you'd offer yourself? You know, I think if I could go back four years ago, I would have told myself, spend twice as much time with the customers. We spent a lot of time with customers, and we spent a lot of time interviewing them. Um, I would have spent even more time and really gotten that voice of the customer early on. Do you think that's that's something that transcends dynamis? It's something that every entrepreneur should be spending a little bit more time and effort? Of course. Uh, of looking course. Looking out, outside instead of in? And there's so many distractions. I mean, look, we 
I just talked about Dan Morrill, 20 years, great product experience. But you sit Dan and Tom and Bob and I around the table, we'll come up with a solution, mm-hmm. but it won't be right unless that table is populated with customers as well. What's been more rewarding for you in your career? Is it uh, making a startup a success, getting to that growth stage? Is it growing from there or is it creating new opportunities inside of a larger organization? You know, for me, what 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 really matters is is seeing the mentoring side of of doing this and seeing young employees grow and seeing them grow in their confidence and their ability. Um, and the ultimate goal is seeing them go out and create their own company someday. Hmm. Man, that seems like a really selfless way to think about that. Are are there real life examples of high potential employees coming to you and opting out? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, to me. The best situations are they're opting out because they got into an amazing MBA program or they're opting out because they want to start their own company or, you know, and to me, that's that's success. When we put someone in a position, you know, to fulfill their dreams, even if it doesn't happen to be with our company, I I view that as a success. And I I can go through countless people that, that that's happened to. We're still friends to this day. We still keep in touch to this day. You know, I'm, I'm happy to, to send somebody off into a, a better opportunity. We talked about the characteristics that you find important in company founders. Are those the same characteristics you look for when you're considering working with somebody, whether that be a dynamist or in any capacity? One, I think a high level of, of trust. And I know that that needs to be earned over time. But if there's not trust, it's, it's going to be really hard to work with someone, whether they're on your team, whether they're a client, whether they're a vendor. Um, and for me, that's kind of a deal breaker. Are there any great new startup ideas that you had that when you look back, you just regret because you didn't have the time to execute them? Okay, a bit of a different question because I'm not the idea guy. I find idea people mm-hmm. and invest in them, um, but that's not my role in this entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, I'll help take an idea and, and form a business and hopefully grow and scale it. Um, but I'm not the one that comes up with these. Okay, ideas. so you've looked at things yeah. and chosen not to get involved. Correct. What are, what are a couple of those? Well, one is Purple Door Ice Cream because I, I don't invest oh. in those types of companies, and I had an opportunity to be one of their first investors, and now I'm a, a very happy consumer. But um, that would have been a great one. Well, you know, there's there's a lot. I mean, even within Golden Angels, I've not invested in all of the Golden Angel deals, and there's been a few successes that I I wished I would have been heavier in, and there's been a few I. I probably should have passed on. When you think about your toughest business day, what comes to mind? Worst, worst, the worst period of time in business is the time you know someone's not right for the role and the time you fire them. All right. And whether that's an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year, yeah, just that it's lingering a, feeling. It's a, it's a horrible feeling and you know what to do. And that's why, you know, people that say hire slow, fire fast. Mm-hmm. It just, it has to happen. And and in my experience, I've unfortunately have quite a bit of experience with this. Almost always on the other end of the table, it's a feeling of relief. One thing I know about you is you're an avid reader. Is there a particular book that's made an impact on your career or even over the past few years at Dynamis? I, I do read a lot. Um, the book that I think has the most relevance for Dynamis was written quite a while ago. Um, it's called The Lean Startup. Um, and we apply those principles to Dynamis every day. Um, all of us have read it. All of us subscribe to the, the theories in that book, and, and we apply that every day. Are there any specific principles in the Lean Startup that um, you use on, an, on a day-in and day-out basis at Dynamis? Yeah, especially during the startup phase, which were the first few years, probably the first three years at Dynamis, I would define that as a, a true startup. Mm-hmm. Um, failing small and failing fast. Um, running the experimentation, getting the feedback, doing the A-B testing. I mean, those are all things you do as a startup. Um, you continue to do those as you grow the company, but but every day should have been learning and feedback and continuing that loop and doing it at a very small scale um, as you conserve your, your cash. Is there a particular time that comes to mind when you saw that process really come into play and it maybe helped you avoid expensive mistakes? It certainly came into play with the product because we are a technology company and the product is the, the, the center of what we do. Um, but then I think we also started to do it when we we also sp- subscribe to the theory of the whole product. And the whole product is really everything we wrap around the technology solution and how it's used by our clients, um, how it 
can help them prospect and sell and retain and, and help them with all the aspects of their business. Um, we did a lot of early experimentation and, and looking for customer feedback as we created the whole product story, not just the technology. You talked about that as what really helped fuel the growth, right, yeah. to get out of startup into the growth stage. Yeah. Are there little things that you focus on day in and day out that, you know, aren't obvious to everybody else? You know, the, the things I like to focus in on day in and day out are really touch points with, with our team and making sure our team has everything they need to be successful. Mm-hmm. Um, we actually have meetings where we force everyone around the table to um, kind of ask what do they need from each other, all right? Does anyone have any needs or unfulfilled needs that someone sitting around the table can help them with? And we try to plow right through that so that time doesn't go by um, without a response. I know you do a lot of reading, in, in not just books, but articles and, and so forth. Um, is there a great business book that should be written that hasn't been yet? So I know there are books on this topic. I haven't found one that I think has cracked the case. Um, so I'm all of a sudden finding myself in a, a predicament that I've never been in in my life where I'm not the youngest generation. There's a younger generation now. It and sucks, doesn't it? It does. I know. It <laughs> snuck up on us. But but here we are not really understanding the generation that is um, comprising half the workforce. Um, and what I would love is a something, whether it's a book or a tool. Survival and, guide. A survival guide. <laughs> um, and understanding really what makes the millennials tick and what can we do to, to attract, retain, and help them flourish um, and I have not cracked that case yet. I've read a couple of books on it that um, – Yeah, they take swings at it. There's chapters on it and so forth, but nothing really focused on – You know, it's it's interesting because I, I think the, the books and articles that I've read about millennials, a couple of whom are joining us today, um, are uh, – they're focused on what makes the millennials tick but as opposed to what can help the earlier generations relate with Right, them, right? right. And that's really it, relating and, and not being false about it. I mean – if you could spend 30 minutes with anybody in the world seeking business advice, who do you think you'd choose? You know what? Everyone talks about the the success stories. Everyone knows Jeff Bezos. Everyone knows Bill Gates. I'd want to talk to somebody who's had a few companies spectacularly fail hmm. under the premise that you had to insert truth serum into them prior to that conversation <laughs> yeah. and really understand what are their regrets, where do they think they went wrong, um, how did this go off the rails? And I'd really want to, I'd really want to learn. Cause I don't think by nature, people don't open up about those things. Well, it's certainly not something that we celebrate. No. Right. I mean, you, you talk about battle scars and so forth and how that makes you attractive for the next role that you're seeking, et cetera. But it's, it's not something that, uh, you read bestsellers about. Right. Right. What would you consider to be your biggest distraction during the work day? And how do you go about avoiding that? Yeah, um, it's it's my iPhone, and the thing has so many alerts. Any little thing that happens, um, you know, right now it's it's sitting across the room, so I don't even know what's happening with it. And I'm trying to get into the practice of um, leaving it in, in another room when I go into meetings and just not having that distraction. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's counterproductive, and I think it, of all things, it it it's not just a, a time suck. It it sucks the focus out of you. I'm less present when I'm in meetings and that phone's jiggling in my pocket. Um, and I'm less focused on a project or a task. You just can't get quite dialed in when you're constantly If you're distracted every five minutes, you're not going to get anything done. What, what good habits have you developed over the years that have led you to where you are today in terms of your success in, in business? You know, I think one of, one of my best habits um, that I have practiced since early days is is really finding the right people and then empowering them to do well and then just get out of their way. Mm-hmm. Um, at GE, I was in a role where I actually called it hyper delegation, and I practiced it to a fault because what's the worst that can happen? I mean, you get fired and you go work for another company. So it, to me, there was no downside in practicing that. Probably went a little bit overboard there, but I I learned some really valuable habits of of giving people the tools to be successful and helping them and, and break down roadblocks for them. But, but don't micromanage and don't be, I mean, if we hire the right people that want to be empowered and can have that degree of ambiguity, um, then we should give it to them. You talked about lean principles. Mm-hmm. 
and about listening to customers. From a personal standpoint, how do you go about testing the business assumptions or the conclusions that you've reached you know, preliminarily before you uh, make a decision within the company and, and yeah. have people moving in a certain direction? And, and, and look, uh, let's be fair. Many of the decisions we've made in our company, we've since reversed. Um, I'd rather make a decision and have it be you know, 80% right, but it's made and we move forward than lingering on a decision and it never gets to 100% right and it never gets made. Mm-hmm. Um, so we tend to make decisions fairly quickly, but then we always leave ourselves open for more feedback and, and, and can easily reverse almost every decision. We Sounds make. a little bit like an extension of fail fast, fail small. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you're such a big part of the community. Let's spend a few minutes talking about Milwaukee. If somebody's coming to town, where, where are the top five places they can grab a bite to eat? Depending on what they're looking for, if they're looking for brunch um, and they don't mind a little bit of edginess, I'd take them to Engine Company number three on National Avenue or a Movita on 2nd Street. Um, if they're looking for a, a, a decent meal, um, I take them to All Purpose Kitchen on 2nd Street um, or Good Kind in Bayview or Pastiche in Bayview. Of course, I mean, you've got the standbys, Carnivore for steaks, the Bartolatas for Yeah, Surgeon you know, Bartolatas, right. Of course. What do you find as being the significant advantages to growing a company in Milwaukee? I suppose challenges too, but there's got to be some strong upside for you. I think there's a lot more upside um, than challenges. So first and foremost, Milwaukee people are real. The people that live here are genuine. Um, If you think about some of the statistics, higher loyalty rates, lowest absenteeism, high volunteerism. I mean, all the qualities you would look for in in the people you want to surround yourself with. And, And we've got it all here. What about challenges? I think challenges as you're thinking about growing and scaling a company um, in certain segments, Milwaukee actually has a very low unemployment rate. It's effectively zero with developers mm-hmm. and people that build the technology that we use. It's effectively zero with welders if you're talking about a manufacturing situation. Um, and so we run into roadblocks with with talent in pockets. It takes time, right? I mean, it, the good news is you're going after people that are already employed. The bad news is you're going after people that are already employed. Right. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've really come to respect and admire about you is how involved you are in many different parts of the Milwaukee community. I'd really appreciate it if you could just spend a few minutes talking about the the things you care about in the Milwaukee community. Yeah, and, you know, what I've learned in in my my older age is to really only become involved with things that I'm personally passionate about. Um, I had joined a few boards early on just because it seemed like a good board to be on. Um, And I've... I've, um, shied away from all of those situations now you know so for me i'm passionate about the symphony i played french horn and trumpet as a kid um i love going to the symphony so i I was a patron well before i was a, a volunteer um and so helping the symphony get through its financial situation it's in right now and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and helping guide that and helping make that happen to me is is very exciting mm-hmm. your personal contributions are pretty well documented in milwaukee what about dynamis do you do you have particular objectives with regard to community involvement that are, are a part of the dynamis culture? You know, my, my philosophy there has always been um, we'll create an environment where the people at dynamis and our employees can thrive and they'll have discretionary time and discretionary money and resources that then they can channel back into the community. So as an entity, as a business, we really don't get involved in that. We were involved in, um, the UPAF campaign, and we're involved in things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but what we want to do is allow our employees to be good community citizens, and that's really first and foremost. Rather than channeling it through a company, forcing the company to give to things just because they're my pet projects, yep. we'd rather make our employees available and keep them happy and engaged. In terms of your daily routine, would you consider yourself an early bird or a night owl? Early bird. Um, I run along the lake every morning in the winter. It's on the treadmill. But um, if, if I'm up after the sun, maybe not in the summer months, but and then something's wrong. Okay. So um, other than the run, are there other elements to a morning routine that you have in yeah. terms of being productive during the day? You know, so my morning routine always starts with a run. It's usually three miles. It's never with headphones. It's never with a, a TV screen. Um, and that's kind of my thinking time. If I could retain a third of what I think of on those runs, it's a, it's a good day. And then it's usually the gym. Um, and, and after that, and then a a quick breakfast. And then after that, 
You know, anything can happen during the day, and it's not going to be that bad. You know, and it's always, almost always um, preceded by seven and a half to eight hours of sleep, which somehow people think I don't sleep, um, but I, I need seven and a half to eight hours every night. A few years ago, you delivered the commencement address at Valpo, where you did your undergrad. If HBS asked you to do something like that today, what topic do you think you would focus on? You know, that's funny. HBS uses one measurement for success, and it's, it's got a dollar sign before it. Um, and what I think I would try to convey to that graduating class is, is really redefine success and redefine leadership. Leadership doesn't mean a title on the wall, um, and success doesn't necessarily mean a dollar sign. Um, and I think about, you know, the impact that they can have on the world, on their families, and on their deathbed, what would they look back and, and say about their life? As you think about uh, your world post-Dynamis at some point, um, what do you think about? What, what are you interested in doing next? What sort of thing? Or do you not, have you not? I, I try thought? not to think about it because I, I think that's distracting and it's distracting from the mission at hand. Um, I know I'll continue to invest and I'll continue to look at startups. And I'll probably do that until the day I die. Um, and whether that's a source of income or a source of personal fulfillment, it's, it's probably going to be a combination of the two, hopefully. Um, but I really don't try to think too hard about what's next because Dynamis, I think, has a long runway ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So episode one is in the books. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen. I hope you enjoyed it and consider it time well spent. If so, please like it on YouTube or iTunes. That doesn't even sound right coming out of my mouth, but apparently that makes a big difference. Better yet, Share it with the friends and colleagues you think could benefit from the insights Andy shared in the last 35 minutes or so. In any event, we'd appreciate your feedback, good or bad, so we can make the show as great as it can be without actually paying people who know what they're doing. I also want to say a special thanks to the team around me for their efforts in making the Growth Minded Podcast a reality. You can find us and subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, or YouTube at the Growth Minded Podcast channel. On Twitter, we're at growthminded.io, or on our website, featuring articles and new episodes every couple of weeks, and that's growthminded.io. Thanks again. Have a great week.